Like a lot of people around my age, I was a pretty big fan of Yu-Gi-Oh! growing up. I rented the original series DVDs from my local blockbuster, bought the cards to play my own janky meta with friends, and, of course, played a lot of the tie-in games made by everyone's favorite developer, Konami. It's pretty well known how odd and wonky a lot of the early games in the series are, often playing with bizarre variations of the card game's rules, like the Sacred Cards and Reshift duology, or going with a completely unique board-based system like Duelists of the Roses. While I certainly have a lot of nostalgic fondness for these games, except Reshift. Dear Lord, Reshift. The Yu-Gi-Oh! game I played the most as a kid is also one of the least covered on this platform. Released in 2002 in Japan and 2003 in North America and Europe for the Nintendo GameCube, Yu-Gi-Oh! The False Bound Kingdom is a hybrid real-time strategy turn-based RPG, where, instead of playing the Duel Monsters card game, characters from the anime and manga series command monsters themselves to do battle. It's over-ambitious, super slow, kinda boring, and holds an incredible 44% on Metacritic, but I still have a lot of nostalgic fondness towards it. I got it for the first time a few months after it released, and, being a dumb baby, spent most of my time ignoring the campaign mode, and instead dicked around a ton in the challenge mode. Mixing and matching monsters from the series was really all I needed to be satisfied with the game, so I don't think I really dove into the story of the game until a few years later. I always remembered enjoying it, but it has been about a decade since I've actually completed the game, so I'm curious to see how it holds up in 2021, for better or worse. So in a move I'm sure my already small audience will love, let's go completely off-brand and dive into an almost two-decade-old anime and manga tie-in game. So welcome to the Yu-Gi-Oh! The False Bound Kingdom video absolutely nobody asked for. Before diving into the game proper, I thought it would be interesting to look into the team that developed it, though I wasn't able to find much so it won't take too long. According to Moby Games, Kazuki Takahashi wrote a draft of the scenario, but the script, along with planning and game design, is credited to an individual called Truth. Unfortunately, googling Kanami Truth got me nowhere very quickly. Satoshi Shimomura was the producer, a role he held on basically all of the weird, experimental early Yu-Gi-Oh! games. Forbidden Memories, Duelists of the Roses, the Reshift duology, and this were all done by him. He last produced a Shaman King game before seemingly vanishing into the ether. The general director was Morikuni Kubo, the only time he's held the title. His only credits are on the aforementioned experimental Yu-Gi-Oh games and Die Hard Arcade. The only other real bit of insight I was able to gleam was, due to the high level of staff crossover with the other games Shimomura has produced, I'm led to believe the same general team made all of them. You can pick between a Yugi or Kaiba campaign upon starting the game. Yugi's is definitely the easier of the two, mostly due to getting way better monsters and generally more lax scenarios. I wouldn't exactly say that Kaiba is the hard mode of the game, but his scenarios tend to be a little bit more difficult, and his monster pool is quite lacking in comparison. The order you play them in doesn't really matter, as they're independent of each other, not concurrent. But I will say that playing Yugi's story after Kaiba's is pretty underwhelming plot-wise, so let's start there. The game proper opens with a quote from philosopher Alexander Irvine, because of course it does. Those who claim to control the gods are, in fact, controlled by the gods. Yugi and friends have received an invitation from SIC, a company researching virtual reality technology, to act as beta testers for their new game, the Dual Kingdom Simulator. For people who are curious where this story works into the overall scope of the original series, it takes place after Battle City, with Yugi being invited based on his success in the tournament. They're met by Roland, who's apparently jumped ship from Kaiba Corp, who tells them that they'll be playing as members of a resistance seeking to overthrow a tyrannical emperor. Before logging in, Yami Yugi suspects something's up with the whole situation, and, shocker, he's right. After getting a brief rundown of the simulator's plot, it goes into Mode 2, trapping everybody inside. Yugi wakes up and learns from a man called Shimon that he's not only been cast as the leader of the resistance against Emperor Heishin, but he's also a marshal, an individual that can control dual monsters in battle. Marshals are apparently rare enough for the resistance to only have three in their ranks, 
despite the dozens of same-faced grunts we'll see throughout the game who are also marshals. Great world building. Not having much other choice, Yugi decides to lead the resistance, and they begin their campaign against the Empire. To say there's not much to the plot is a bit of an understatement. Well, okay, maybe that's a little harsh. They tell you a lot of details about the world, and how the Resistance is strategically taking down the Empire, but it's all done through voiceless text dumps, so it's honestly really hard to actually care about what's happening. During the missions, typically all the dialogue you'll get outside of Shimon explaining tutorial stuff early on is Yugi, Shimon, and maybe one other person saying a few lines about the mission, and then the generic villain dialogue from the enemy boss. Seriously, man, these villains are so bland and irrelevant, I swear you could swap who says what, and you'd never even notice. They're all reused characters from Forbidden Memories as well, so some of their ancient Egyptian aesthetic doesn't even match with the medieval look this game has. We end up gradually finding Yugi's friends along the way, as well as other characters invited to beta test like Mako Tsunami, but they typically don't say much beyond their initial conversation. To be completely honest, the only bit of the plot that really stands out in the first several missions is when, during the third mission, we let the enemy take a base, wait until nightfall, and then torch them in an ambush. It's actually a nice little set piece with some cool gameplay benefits too, but for the most part, missions can really tend to blend together. Granted, I feel like I should bring up the fact that, at least in-universe, the story of the simulation is really second to the actual virtual reality game that SIC was making. With technology so complex, why not just go with the cookie-cutter medieval fantasy setting, full of reused assets from other games? I guess I can appreciate this on a meta level, as you could very well interpret it as the developers using the simulation as a stand-in for the game itself. It clearly doesn't have a very high budget, as there's a crazy amount of assets that are reused from other Yu-Gi-Oh games, to the point that the game's idea of cutscene spectacle are static images of characters on slightly animated backgrounds. So I can see this as the devs being a tad cheeky, and presenting it as cheaply constructed in-universe for a bit of fun or venting. Unfortunately, that doesn't change the fact that I still need to play through the purposely generic plot. This plays a fair bit better in Kaiba's story, where he actively lampshades how bland the setting is, and openly challenges the AI characters. But when we're following Yugi, everything is played completely straight, and just winds up feeling completely unsubstantial. That's all I have to say about the early portion of the game, so let's go ahead and talk about the basic gameplay for a bit, before the plot picks up the pace. The Falsebound Kingdom is a hybrid, real-time strategy, turn-based RPG. Gameplay is split between commanding monsters on a battlefield map, and turn-based battles where the player controls three monsters assigned to a marshal to defeat an enemy. Battles play out in a very traditional JRPG fashion. Each monster has an HP, attack, defense, and action point stat that determines their performance in battle and you win encounters by either eliminating each of the other side's monsters, or accruing more points than them once both sides have run out of action points. In battle, you can choose to attack, defend, wait, use a special command, use a consumable item, or attempt to run away at the cost of all of the monster's AP. Monsters themselves are divided into types, consisting of warrior, fiend, beast, spellcaster, spirit, dragon, and machine with each having their own abilities and equipment draw. Unfortunately, not all monsters are created equal, with spirits, spellcasters, and warriors often offering far more AP, abilities, and equipment than dragons, for example. Nothing's necessarily unusable, yes, even Karibo, but don't be surprised when you see swordsmen from a foreign land putting in more work than, say, Curse of Dragon. Combat in general can start to feel very samey very quickly. Each monster only has one basic attack, and there's no type advantage system in play, so it really just comes down to hitting the enemies with the highest AP hard enough until they die, rinse and repeat. I guess there's a little more nuance than that, like managing your damage to account for enemies with healing items, knowing when to guard, etc. But overall, combat certainly isn't anything complicated. If anything, I think it's a little bit too simple for its own good. You can spice things up by using consumable magic spells should a monster be able to cast them, but with only a couple of exceptions, I barely found them to be relevant, as brute forcing your way through most fights is more than enough to easily coast you through the game. In addition to commanding monsters, marshals have their own abilities, stat spread, and something I've dubbed the Affinity Orb. Abilities are pretty standard. 
discounts at shops, cheaper construction, moving faster with specific monster types, you get it. Each marshal tends to have preferred stats they level over others. Joey prefers BP, My AP, Rex HP, and characters like Yugi and Kaiba maintain a balanced spread. The most interesting aspect of marshals, in my opinion, is the orb found at the bottom right of their status screen. Each marshal's orb starts at a set color, but can change based on the monsters they use. See, each monster also has their own orb that starts at a specific color, but will gradually change to match the colors of its fellow monsters and the marshal it's assigned to. The closer in color a monster and marshal's orb are, the better they'll perform. This is an example of what the same team of monsters looks like on a marshal they fully match, versus a character they don't. I actually think this is a really neat system, as it allows players to pick their favorites, and even if the monster isn't terribly good, it allows nearly any of them to stay competitive as long as you stick with them. During the RTS portions of the gameplay, you'll command specific marshals around a map, encountering other marshals and conquering bases. Bases can be outfitted with a variety of armaments, like cannons for weakening enemies, or barricades to increase stats in combat. I think the biggest issue with this portion of the game, aside from how slow everything moves, is the fact that the AI has a very one-track mind. With a few exceptions, it always makes a beeline towards your main base, as they'll win if they conquer it, which means that you'll always be able to pick which characters fight which enemy, set up appropriate cannons, etc. Like, they barely even try to go after the neutral bases, it's just a conga line towards your main base. Consequences be damned. The last thing I want to bring up regarding the RTS portion of the gameplay is the shop system. By establishing a trader at a base, you gain access to a shop that will sell you three items. Said items are different between the bases, and the game will never tell you what they sell prior, meaning you'll need to blindly invest your gold to get a look at their wares. I'm not terribly fond of this design, as money can actually be quite tight early on, and item distribution throughout the game is really scattered. This means you can lose access to important pieces of equipment, or even items that allow monsters to evolve into stronger forms, like Gaia the Fierce Knight becoming Blackluster Soldier, and Red Eyes Black Dragon becoming Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon, simply because you've ran out of cash trying to figure out what the traders sell. That said, the devs were kind enough to include an easy solution to this problem in the form of inputting the Konami code. Should you do this on the map, you'll hear Yu Yu and be awarded a free 500 or so gold. I mean, I appreciate that it's there, I guess, and I did use it a bit during my playthrough, but I just wish they didn't make traders something you had to invest in. Did you really have to build them before you could buy your items? Like, there had to have been a better solution than basically just giving the player an in-game cheat code, right? There's one more basic element of gameplay that I want to talk about, but it does require going in a bit more depth. Let's talk about roaming monsters. <laughs> In addition to gaining monsters from new marshals and liberating certain areas, you can also acquire monsters by running into them on a specific part of the map in a one-time encounter. Defeat them or score more points than the monsters, and they'll join up. Get defeated by them, and, well, tough shit. Like I said, these encounters are one-time only, so you either have to reload the mission and try again, or replay the whole campaign and hope you can win on the next go-around. I really wish that was the only issue with roaming monsters, but there's a lot more. The biggest problem with roaming monsters is the fact that, for the most part, the game gives you basically no clues at all as to where they're located, or even if a mission in question has roaming monsters at all. Let's take Yugi's first mission, for example. The monster is located in the woods on the way to the enemy base. Totally fine. Most players will probably go this way on their first playthrough. In his next mission, the roaming monsters are in a forest on the top left of the map. A little out of the way, but hey, maybe it would stick out enough for you to take a look. It's only when you get to the third mission that things start to kind of fall apart. The roaming monster here is located in the completely out of the way mountains, and to make things worse, the encounter can only be triggered by running into them with Yugi. This, unfortunately, is the form that most roaming monsters take throughout the rest of the campaign. They'll be at a completely out of the way location to what you actually need to do to clear the mission. So even if you're using a text guide, you can spend a lot of time fumbling around trying to hit the exact trigger point. It's a shame that if you're playing the game without outside help, you're bound to miss more than you'd actually find. I'd actually be okay with how cryptic some of these could be if the game had some sort of hint system to help you find them. 
Maybe, I don't know, you could pay gold to a fortune teller or something, and they could give you some type of riddle or prediction to give you a general idea of where the monsters are. There's still a bit more to talk about with roaming monsters, but I'll address it a bit later on. Getting back to the story, Yugi and the Rebels finally managed to corner Heishin in the seventh mission of his campaign. After defeating him with Joey and Mai's help, Heishin attempts to retreat, only to be intercepted by our actual primary villain, Scott Irvine. Who? Growing up, I always assumed that Scott was just a game-only character created for Falsebound Kingdom. People like Heishin, his generals, Fizdiz, who I just realized I, I didn't actually <laughs> didn't introduce her, oh no. All originated in Yu-Gi-Oh! games instead of the manga or anime, so I thought that was the case for Scott too. Little did I know that not only is Scott a sort of established character, he's in a surprising amount of Yu-Gi-Oh! media. If you've seen the anime, you probably remember the episode where Kaiba is testing the dual disc and summons Obelisk against the computer. Well, there's Scott in the control room with Mokuba. He also shows up briefly in the Pyramid of Light and Dark Side of Dimensions movies. However, between all of these appearances, Scott is never actually named and speaks a little over 100 individual words during his entire screen time. He doesn't really display much, if any, character at all. He's literally just a Kaiba Corp employee. So it really does beg the question, why the hell was he chosen to be the villain of this game? The only guess I have is that Takahashi, who, remember, wrote a draft of the scenario, either really enjoyed his character design, or maybe had plans to do more with him in the manga, and instead had him feature in this. Again, it's just a guess, but it's the only explanation I've got to explain his presence here. It's, it's just so baffling, like, really. Regardless, Scott reveals himself to be the creator of the Kingdom Simulation, and promptly deletes Heishin out of existence. This ushers in the second act of the game, with Scott now acting as the main villain, and us seeing more traditional Yu-Gi-Oh characters as the generic bosses. To the game's credit, they definitely start amping things up a bit, as the next mission is one of the more difficult in the entire game. Taya is defending a group of refugees from Scott's forces, and it's game over if she dies. In addition, this is also your first encounter with fusion monsters. The new monster comes in with full AP and higher stats, meaning there's a decent chance you can lose matches if you're not prepared. Or if you don't no, you can just escape and immediately undo the fusion. Eh, points for trying, I guess. She either needs to wade her way through the marshals, which runs the risk of her dying, or you need to do something I'm not even sure the game wants you to do. Manipulate the AI. If you send her straight up at the very start of the mission, the enemy Burfamet teams will actually collide into each other, slowing them down enough for Taya to get a sizable lead on them and escape. Again, no idea if this is what's actually intended to happen, but it was consistent for me on multiple playthroughs. It's a pretty standard mission after that, but props for making me actually think creatively. The next few don't follow suit, but I do want to praise this game the occasional time it does something neat. We attempt to corner Scott a couple missions later, only for him to brainwash Joey, Taya, and Bakora. Yeah, it's not exactly the most original villain plot in the world, but there's at least some personal stakes now. We free them over the course of the next few missions, and get some nice scenes with Mai wanting to be the one who frees Joey. It's a decent little character moment for her, which is something we've had a lack of for the cast as a whole so far. It's during this portion of the story that Kaiba finally shows up, helping Yugi in his first battle with the mind-controlled Joey. The devs even gave him a spectacle cutscene, which, while a nice gesture, they, uh... They kind of put him in front of the wrong map. Like, we're on this map fighting Joey, and Kaiba's clearly in front of the first map from his campaign instead. This scene really is the Falsebound Kingdom in a nutshell. It's incredibly well-intentioned and full of good ideas, but the execution is kind of rushed and lacking, diminishing a lot of its impact. Yami Bakura also shows up around this point, having feigned mind control in order to strike a deal with Scott. If Bakura agrees to lure out Yugi's location, he'd receive an army of his own from Scott. The idea of having a new, more chaotic force in the plot is actually a really neat one, and it's a shame it only lasts for like two missions. After freeing his friends, Yugi is confronted by Kaiba, who's being strong-armed into working for Scott because he's kidnapped Mokuba. Damn, poor kid can't catch a break even in the weird spin-off games. Yugi agrees to save Mokuba, whose kidnapping led him to figure out that Scott is just a player in the simulation, since he needed to blackmail Kaiba, instead of using some crazy Game Master powers to brainwash him. Once we defeat Scott, he proceeds to retreat to the hallowed land of Ishtar 
We find Mokuba in a temple there and free him, but there's not even a scene with Kaiba reuniting with him. We just leave him there and move on. It kind of feels like they're sprinting towards the end game here. Tailing Scott through a hidden door, we find ourselves at the core of the simulation. After going through way too many cramped hallways and beating up Gate Guardian, we find Scott rambling to himself about a dark spirit. It turns out that he created the entire program in order to offer Duelist Spirit to a being called Dark Knight, and that the dual discs from the start of the game are literally linked to our souls, and he plans to use that energy to summon the being. Dark Knight is another reused character from Forbidden Memories in Duelist of the Roses, where he acted as the surprise final boss in those games as well. He was manipulating Scott in order to be revived into the outside world, so, much like Scott did to Heishin previously, he deletes him out of existence. He summons Obelisk, what, you thought we'd go an entire JRPG without fighting a god? And we defeat him with sheer numbers, since we can just run everybody into him and be fine so long as Yugi doesn't die. With Dark Knight eliminated, the simulation ends and the story very quickly wraps up, with SIC burning down, us escaping, and Scott never being found. The story ends with Scott's final words after he left Kaiba Corp, which I actually think is the first time we even learn of him working for them in Yugi's campaign, though I could be wrong. It is inevitable that those who realize the existence of the gods wish eventually to control them. Man, talk about going full circle with the beginning of the game. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. Yugi's campaign is a little hard for me to sum up my feelings on. On the one hand, he gets most of my favorite characters and a very good flow of noteworthy monsters, which makes team building a lot of fun. In particular, the Dark Magicians and Harpy Ladies are genuinely game-breaking with their combo attacks. On the other hand, the plot never really had a hook for me, even after the brainwashing and Yami Bakura's appearance. I also really have to wonder if I'm just missing something with the quotes that bookend the game, but it feels so forced in an attempt to give the endgame reveal any amount of depth. The missions also feel very homogenous, with only a few outliers like Teya's escape in Refugees and the showdown with Bakura in Betrayed really standing out. That's not to say I didn't enjoy my time with the campaign, but coming back to it after so long, I really began to notice how much I was on autopilot by around the halfway point. Before we move on to Kaiba's story, I want to take a look at the New Game Plus mode of the game we unlocked by completing Yugi's. After finishing one of the campaigns for the first time, all of the enemy encounters in subsequent playthroughs, with the hilarious exception of the final Scott battle for some reason, get a flat 30 level increase, and you're allowed to carry over all of the monsters and items you have from the first playthrough. This isn't as big a deal as you might expect, as the enemies are so underpowered that as long as you equip properly, you'll be fine. Another bonus you get from completing a campaign is an item that allows you to summon Dark Knight's Egyptian God once permission, effectively giving you an instant win button for a battle. However, New Game Plus does showcase another pretty unfortunate aspect of roaming monsters, the fact that the vast majority of them join you at level 1. Admittedly, this was an issue during the initial playthrough, what with level 99 Gaia the Fierce Knight joining up at level 1, but it's really egregious here, where the monsters the enemies use are scaled up even higher. Mind you, they're not impossible to use, but them starting so far behind can make it take a lot longer to unlock their additional attack effects or specials if they have them. It actually kind of conditioned me to utilize mainly the carryover monsters from the first campaign, rather than experimenting with any new ones I got. Thankfully, monsters on Marshall's initial team do get the level boost, so it's not all bad. With that small aside done, let's head into Kaiba's story. Kaiba's plot begins with him and Mokuba arriving at SIC, in order to discuss a proposed collaboration with their VR tech in the dual disc. For the most part, the intro plays out the same until Kaiba wakes up in the simulation, but we do get a little more info on Roland's involvement in the dual disc development, as well as Kaiba directly foreshadowing Scott. Kaiba is cast as the head of the Imperial Guard, and Mokuba is a soldier working under him. Heishin tasks them with taking out some rebels, while also assigning his right-hand man, Marthus, yet another reused Forbidden Memories character, to assist them. Kaiba and Marthus' personalities immediately clash with each other, with the former becoming increasingly annoyed at the latter's insistence at following the Emperor's every word. From Kaiba ignoring the Empire's protocol, to using his position of power over Marthus to spare Bones, who was a prisoner of war after Bandit Keith ditched him, to straight up just insulting him, you can really feel the tension between the two, and it's pretty great. Heck, at the end of the first mission, he straight up threatens to rip out Marthus's tongue and feed it to the dogs, and believe it or not, they actually reference the line a little bit later. Kaiba is eventually sent to quell a rebel uprising led by Pegasus, a noble who wants to overthrow the Empire 
fire to unify man and monster. After overcoming his Say You're Sorry attack, my god, what, what, what an incredible game. Pegasus calls Kaiba to a secret meeting and offers him an alliance, having sensed that he wasn't entirely loyal to the Empire during their battle. Marthus interrupts things and reports the act to Heishi, with Kaiba set to be executed a few days later. Kaiba responds to this by calling them both useless programs and makes an escape with Bones and Mokuba. Marthus leads an army against us, with Kaiba presumably following through with his promise of feeding his tongue to the dogs and takes Marthus out permanently. Pegasus shows up and offers Kaiba leadership of his resistance, which he agrees to, and they go off and bolster their forces. So in case you hadn't noticed by the amount of detail I went into, Kaiba's first few missions are honestly pretty good from a story perspective. Not only do we get some more details on the SIC staff, we also see the inner workings of the Empire, as bland as it might be, and some genuinely interesting moments for Kaiba. Kaiba as a whole might be the biggest highlight of this entire game, honestly, since he knows he's trapped in a crappy game and doesn't hesitate to straight up refer to characters as bits of code and lampshade how generic the setting is. Also, while it's not anything remarkable from a writing perspective, Kaiba butting heads with Marthus is so much more than Yugi got in his campaign, where it felt like he was just going through the motions the whole time. Marthus being killed immediately after he left is a bit unfortunate, but they did do a good job making you hate him, so it was at least satisfying to take him out. I really wish I could say Kaiba's story stays this entertaining throughout the entire playthrough, but unfortunately things are about to get much more standard in the following missions. After a short detour to the forest and plains to recruit Weevil and Rex respectively, Kaiba sets out to slowly strike against the Empire. That's all that really happens in this stretch of the game. So I'll instead use this portion of the video to talk about easily the most infamous aspect of the False Bound Kingdom. If you've heard anything about this game, it's likely in relation to the roaming monster known as Moisture Creature and its baffling obscurity. It takes every flaw present with roaming monsters and cranks them all up to beyond 11. First off, it's one of two roaming monsters on Kaiba's seventh mission, so you'll likely skip over it after defeating the other group, since multiple roaming monsters in the same mission are rare. Second, Moisture Creature is located near a completely out-of-the-way base you have literally no business going to, as the mission itself is a frantic, time-based raid on a supply line. Thirdly, Kaiba needs to be the marshal who encounters it, because of course he does. However, what pushes Moisture Creature over the edge and into insanity is the fact that it has no specific location on the map, just a path that it moves along. Yes. Moisture Creature is an invisible, moving, roaming monster, the only instance of this occurring in the game. So you're probably wondering how in the world you're supposed to actually find a Moisture Creature. Fuck if I know. The best method people have come up with is making a cannon and watchtower at the base, having Kaiba use a large monster as his leader, and going to this specific part of the cannon's ring and just waiting. See, this portion of the map is apparently in its path and by waiting here long enough, Moisture Creature will eventually just bump into you. I genuinely don't know how anyone in their right mind is supposed to figure this out. Like, I get that having super obscure secrets can be fun for developers, but this is about five steps too far for me. Moisture Creature's weirdness doesn't even stop there. Apparently, it's actually an alien named Moisha that got trapped in the simulation. It's a fucking alien that just decided to join us. It has incredibly high base stats and the ability to use level 5 magic even at level 1. You'd think it would be an awesome, super overpowered reward for finding such an obscure secret. And then you look at its AP. Yep, for the most part, it gets one action per turn, which can make it downright unusable unless you load it up with equipment to boost its AP. I used it for a few missions out of morbid curiosity, but it being dead weight so often eventually did make me bench it. But you know what? Maybe I'm just bad. I did some research and Moisture Creature is actually used in a speedrun for this game? Like, you know what? Sure, I'm not even surprised. Let's just get back to the story after all this nonsense. After defeating Heishin, the Scott reveal plays out mostly the same until Kaiba confronts him. We learn that Scott was also part of the team that worked on the dual disc, and that Kaiba lost all contact with him after Battle City. Like in Yugi's campaign, we're ambushed by Scott's army and are forced to retreat. Unlike the other campaign, however, Yugi arrives to help us in the next mission, and he and Kaiba form a reluctant alliance for the next couple of stages. I also want to signal out the boss of this mission. Uh, it's the rare hunter from the anime, you know, with the three copies of Exodia pieces. Because he has my absolute favorite bad line in the game. You, the little boys defying Master Scott. You should give up. 
It's so unthreatening, it's actually incredible. At the end of the mission, Mokuba gets lost during an escape and is promptly kidnapped. What's really bizarre about this is that the kidnapping isn't referenced in any way for the next two missions. There's no scene of Kaiba reacting to his brother going missing, no scene of a messenger or someone telling him Mokuba was kidnapped, even the pre-battle narration doesn't mention it. Mokuba's just gone, and no one acknowledges it. Kaiba decides to actually acknowledge his brother's disappearance a couple of missions later. He learns from Bandit Keith that Mokuba is being held in the Imperial capital of Sai Varts and then decides he needs to bolster his army with the Blue Eyes White Dragons. This leads to Pegasus and Kaiba alone, journeying to the appropriately named White Dragon, all one word, Mountains. There, they liberate all of the burrows, and Kaiba obtains his signature monsters. At level 1. Really, game? We're two-thirds of the way into a New Game Plus playthrough, and Kaiba's quest to get the Blue Eyes rewards him with three level 1 dragons that are going to underperform against even some of the more mediocre monsters in his campaign without a good amount of favoritism. I still used them, since it did feel weird having Kaiba run a team of Dark Magicians, but it was a bit of a pain to grind them up. Blue Eyes in hand, Kaiba continues his campaign against Scott, eventually meeting the simulation's version of Ashizu, the Empire's High Priest. She laments how she allowed the High mage, later revealed to be Merrick in the next story, to become corrupted by Scott's influence, and wants to make amends by joining up with us. And with that, we've completed the mini Yorkist reunion that is Kaiba's army. We're ambushed by Scott, for what feels like the third time at this point, and after we defeat him, he blackmails Kaiba into fighting with Yugi, just like we saw in the other story. That said, the following mission might be the coolest in the entire game. As opposed to Yugi's version of Face Off, Kaiba actually fights Yugi's marshals. They have fitting, fairly decent teams, move in a competent formation, and it ends with Yugi using the Dark Magician duo on his team. It's such a neat mission from a fanservice perspective. It really makes me sad that Yugi's version is just Kaiba and some generics. At the end of the mission, Pegasus has a meeting with Yugi explaining Kaiba's circumstances, and, cool guy that he is, agrees to sneak into the capital to save Mokuba, much to Kaiba's chagrin. From this point on, the endgame of the two campaigns is almost identical. You defeat Defeat Scott at Sai Varth's, go through Ishtar, and finally defeat the evil spirit at the heart of the simulation. There's a few differences, like Mogaba being freed one mission earlier for Kaiba, and Ishizu revealing that Merrick was the high mage that Scott corrupted, but for the most part, it's identical to what happened with Yugi, so let's skip to the final mission. In Kaiba's campaign, Dark Knight summons Slifer instead of Obelisk, who's probably a tad bit more difficult, since it has a hit-all special that also lowers enemy attack. Once he's defeated, Dark Knight transforms, at least I think so, into a new form called the Nightmare. Another early Yu-Gi-Oh! game tradition, with Nightmare usually serving as the real final boss beyond Dark Knight. He comes packing a level 99 version of Slifer. It's worth noting that the same thing would happen with Obelisk if you played Yugi's campaign second. It's of course tougher than the previous version, but we can also still throw our entire army at it, so it falls eventually. Though I will give the team behind the game props, they actually created a new camera view for God on God battles, complete with some new animations. The ending is also exactly the same, with SIC burning down and the same cryptic quote from Scott to close the game. While I certainly feel like it starts better than it ends, Kaiba the story is my preference between the two campaigns. Maybe it's just because I found Yugi's plot to be so generic, but it feels like there's a little bit more bite to Kaiba's story. He's a more entertaining lead, he has a slight connection to the main antagonist, a rivalry with Marthus, and generally more interesting missions. It's just consistently more entertaining overall. I won't deny that by this point I was starting to feel a bit burned out with the game, but I can safely say that if you actually want to give the game a shot, I'd recommend it be with Kaiba's story. After clearing both Yugi and Kaiba's campaigns, a third and final one unlocks that focuses on Joey. Unfortunately, there really isn't that much to talk about with it. Joey is cast as the leader of a group of thieves called the Black Dragon Squad, in a prequel story to Yugi's campaign. I'm guessing Joey either entered the simulation earlier than Yugi, or the latter was conked out for like a month in-game, because the vast majority of this campaign happens before Yugi wakes up. Partnered with Jussel and Malai Ruka, aka Villager 1 and 2 from Forbidden Memories, the squad takes the fight to the Empire, and manages to amass a small following. After a while, the Empire sends the High Mage Ishtar after the group, which means that Merrick finally shows up, and the majority of the rest of the story is about that conflict. Trist and Mai and Teya eventually join up, we beat Merrick's forces, corner him deep in the deep forest, man what a good game, and defeat him in Raw. I really do wish there was more for me to say about this story, as Joey is my favorite character, but nothing really happens until the end. 
this is just an entire campaign of Rebels vs. Empire, which, as you'll recall, I found to be the weakest aspect of the story that this one is a prequel to. If I can say something positive about Joey's campaign, the last mission's actually pretty cool, in that it's effectively an expanded version of Kaiba's first mission, where we're leading the bandits he was sent to defeat. Another cool feature of the mission is that Mokuba and Marthus are additional enemy generals, in a similar fashion to us fighting Yugi's marshals in Kaiba's version of Face Off. Kaiba and Joey have their expected banter, and Joey even manages to pull off a win. But given that this is a prequel, there of course has to be a catch. Kaiba was just a decoy to lure us out, and his army managed to pillage the Black Dragon Squad hideout. The group decides to split up, and the story abruptly ends there. I do appreciate the idea of the story being added, as a fun way to expand the game a bit, and give characters who maybe didn't receive a lot of focus in Yugi's campaign a little bit more time to shine. But to be perfectly honest, it's just really insubstantial. The plot is is really barely there, and the maps are all recycled, so I honestly think it should have been cut, in an effort to put more resources into spicing up the other two campaigns. I get the feeling it may have been made just to house all of the remaining roaming monsters they had yet to place. However, given how many missions in the other two campaigns lack roamers, I'm sure they could have found some place to put them. It feels really bizarre that my conclusion is wanting to cut Joey's campaign, but here we are, I guess. I guess to end this segment on a bit of a positive note, there are still some nice character moments sprinkled here and there throughout the story, but that's really not enough to save it, at least in my opinion. Before wrapping things up, I should probably get around to addressing the game's soundtrack. You've been hearing it throughout the video, and I think it's largely pretty great, which is to be expected, because a lot of it is reused from Forbidden Memories and Duelist of the Roses. Don't get me wrong, that's certainly not a bad thing, as the music itself is quite good. It just took me by surprise to learn that several tracks I had associated with this game for years didn't actually originate in it. For example, the prep menu screen in this game was originally composed as Duelist of the Roses' world map theme. Scott's battle theme originated as the High Mage theme in Forbidden Memories. In addition to being used as Nightmare's theme in Duelist of the Roses. For the newly composed tracks for this game, my favorite is probably Vrausen. It's mainly heard during the missions that take place in Craw Valley, and its frantic synth really does fit with how chaotic most of those missions are. Another new track I really like is the nighttime variant of, okay, uh, uh, bear with me on this pronunciation, Sugut? 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 The water level, let's go with that one. It's probably straight up the most gorgeous sounding piece in the entire game. So yeah, the music's really good. Waichiro Ozaki, the composer, did a damn good job on the new tracks, and everything that was reused fits in well. So, if you're still here after all that, well, first off, thank you, but I guess you're wondering if I can actually recommend this game. Well, that's tough. Despite all my complaints throughout this mess of a video, I still find something charming about this game despite its numerous faults. It's slow, boring, samey, and its plot only really works when a single character is making fun of how generic it is. However, it still sounds great, looks okay, and frankly, the core idea of creating teams of iconic DM-era monsters to fight each other is still really appealing. If you're just looking for a solid game, and don't have any love or nostalgia for the Yu-Gi-Oh! series, then yeah, it's obviously a skin. I think that's pretty obvious. That said, if you do have any love for this era of the franchise, or you're a morbidly curious fan of JRPGs, then it might be worth a look, though with a lot of asterisks. While the practice is a tad contentious, I honestly can't imagine playing this game without the fast-forward feature of an emulator. Like, I don't know if I've illustrated it properly throughout this video, but this game can get 
really slow. Certain attack animations take an eternity, movement on the overworld isn't much better, and any event tied to the time of day takes about five times longer than it really needs to. For reference, this is what the majority of my captured footage looked like from my recording sessions. Another must if you want to try this game out is looking up a guide for the roaming monsters and what specific items bases offer. There's just too much trial and error regarding these mechanics that I can't recommend going in blind. If the game still sounds interesting to you after all of those caveats, then I do recommend giving Kaiba's story a try, and if you're really interested, playing further on. The game does have a lot of replay value if you really get into it, ranging from revisiting campaigns to recruit extra monsters, and a challenge mode where you can pick your own campaign monsters against specifically created teams of powerful marshals. So, yeah, that's all I have to say regarding this weird, weird game from my childhood. Despite all my gripes, I still enjoy it, and hopefully I've given you enough context to see if you'd want to give it a go yourself. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on whatever I decide to cover next.